Doctorow. Uh, I'm back at the UCLA uh, uh, Law School uh, for the second day of the DMC 1201 hearings, and we've just heard a procedure uh, or a hearing on, on a, a possible exemption to expand fair use, and, and with me are the people who argue for it. I wonder if you can introduce yourselves, and uh, maybe one of you can talk about what the exemption you were asking for was. Well, I'm Jack Lerner. I'm a professor at UC Irvine Law School, and I direct the UCI Intellectual Property Arts and Technology Clinic. And we were here on behalf of documentary and non-documentary independent filmmakers, as well as multimedia ebook e authors. Um, I'm Betsy Rosenblatt. I'm a law professor. I teach at Whittier Law School and direct the Center for Intellectual Property Law there. And I'm also the legal chair for the Organization for Transformative Works. And I'd like to say it wasn't a hearing to expand fair use. It was a hearing to, uh, to decrease restrictions on fair use. That's well said. I accept your friendly <laughs> amendment. <Thank you. laughs> These are things that people have a right to do, and we're just taking away that technological limitation. on Yeah, and the way I describe the DMCA, and th there's many parts of the DMCA, but this part is Section 1201 makes it illegal to rip from DVD or Blu-ray. Uh, and the issue with that, and why we're here today, is because it's legal to use the material. You can make fair use of that material, you just can't access it, because the act of ripping from DVD or Blu-ray is illegal and for my clients who are documentary filmmakers they have LLCs that can actually be a crime. It makes so much sense to criminalize <laughs> how you get it but not what you do with once you've got it. I'm Tisha Turk, I'm a professor of English so I get to be the non-lawyer in the room. Uh, at the University of Minnesota at Morris I'm also a member of the Organization for Transformative Works and I am a fan vitter so I'm here representing video remix artists. Hi, I'm Art Neal. I'm the executive director of New Media Rights. Uh, we're actually based at California Western School of Law, where I teach a legal clinic all related to cyber law. And the exemption that we were here arguing for, because there's a couple of, of good positive exemptions, trying to allow more already legal uses. Um, and, and our exemption was to try to streamline language. Right now, that's about 800 words, where you have to figure out, am I making a documentary or not? Am, is what I'm doing non-commercial or not? Am I the right kind of educator? Am I talking about film and media studies, or am I, am I possibly talking about something that is, is not quite film and media studies? And so we were trying to uh, streamline and make the exemption more accessible. So a lot of discussion today turned on um, whether or not there's a market for clips, whether or not if you're just some person who's like in your mom's basement and you're making a cool fan vid, you can just call up a lawyer at Disney or Warner and say, uh, I need these 30 seconds from this movie from 1975, uh, what's it gonna cost me? And um, the argument from the MPA seemed to be like, that's a thing you can do, and we do it thousands of times a year. Do you buy the argument? Not even a little. Um, so uh, the truth is there is absolutely a market for licensing clips. Uh, it exists. It's pretty robust. But it's not for doing the sorts of things that these exemptions are about. Um, the, the markets for using clips tend to be for uh, large-scale commercial productions um, or small-scale commercial productions where somebody isn't making a fair use. Uh, but the uh, the market for uses for criticism and commentary, particularly the uses for criticism and commentary by individuals, um, is uh, is minute. And in fact, most of the form agreements uh, make it uh, a violation of any license that there would be to engage in precisely the thing that these exemptions are about. Yeah, that's the non-disparagement clause. Yeah. 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 You're not allowed to use these clips to make fun of us or criticize us. Or the industry. Or the industry. So, uh, and uh, what about this argument, though, that um, if you have enough money, they'll sell you a license. There's a real estate comparison that I, I know drew some gas. Maybe one yeah, of you so could the, discuss that. The, the, the attorney for the Motion Picture Association of America said, well, he was talking about what I thought was a straw man argument in a sense. It's not, no one's really arguing this, but what he said was uh, there is a market. No one's, he, there is really a viable market here. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous to say there's not a viable market. You know, it's just that some people can't afford it. I mean, I can't afford to live in Bel Air and, uh, uh, you know, and, but it's still a viable market. And to me, that was 
a very interesting, interesting comparison because Bel Air is inaccessible to 99.9 percent .9 of Americans or the world. It's it's one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in the country, um, and the licensing market is also inaccessible to a, a large number of people. And the thing is that digital technology has enabled a cornucopia, an explosion of creativity by individual creators, the type of people that Professor Turk here works with every day. And, and we have clients too that are doing this. They're not major businesses, they're not big production companies based in Santa Monica or Hollywood. They might be a professor in Arkansas or, uh, or an individual creator. And the DMCA is inhibiting that and licensing is also uh, not well licensing is not a viable option as a way to stop that adverse effect that the DMCA is creating. And it should be necessary because the uses that they're making are fair uses anyway. So when the the threshold condition for uh, being eligible for these exemptions is that you're making a fair use. If you're not making a fair use, there's no exemption at all. So uh, to make a fair use, it doesn't make a lot of sense to say you're, it's absolutely non-infringing for you to use this, but you have to pay us to get the key to have access to it. Yeah, a, a lot of the, the uh, this seemed to turn on what was fair use and when something was fair use. And, and someone from the copyright office said, well, if, if, if you interfere with the market for the work, although that's only one of the four factors, that's the one we should be paying attention to. And it seemed like the MPA folks were really running with that. At one point, it seemed, sounded to me like they said, if you let people break DRM, then in the future we might think of things that we could do with DRM, but we would think maybe the Copyright Office would let people break the DRM and we wouldn't bother investing in it. That seems pretty expansive to me. Can you think of like any use that you could make that would be fair if that were the test? <laughs> so I think their, their concern is that, uh, or one concern at least is, they say they don't want to uh, make uh, ripping and decrypting, uh, so it's something that people do casually. They want it to be something that people only do when they uh, feel they need to do it. Uh, but the idea that they should own not only every market for uh, the works that they've made and the derivative works that they might make from those, but that they should also own the market for these technologies that surround those works. Um, seems actually really consistent, inconsistent with the way that technology has developed historically. I was interested in the MPA representative um, when, when asked about this plain language proposal that you had. He said, well, we're never going to get something as complicated as copyright law simple enough for the average user to understand it. That felt to me like a pretty frank admission that everybody who engages in what might be fair use will never know whether they're on the side of the right. I mean, maybe like the, the, the people you work with, the vidders you work with, do you think that there's much of an overlap with your ability to make an important expressive vid and your important to understand abstract areas of technical entertainment law? <laughs> <laughs> That Venn diagram is too independent, uh, maybe not too independent. It's got a sphincter. It's been like a like, <laughs> tiny, 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 tiny bit of overlap. I mean, I was saying in there, like, I'm an English professor. I work with complicated language all the time, but not this complicated language, not this kind of complicated language. And so to me, personally, as a non-lawyer, a, a lot of the exemptions are, I don't want to say needlessly complex, but overly complex, um, more complex than than um, than it's easy to parse. And uh, I don't know if you want me to get into the, the screen capture. Uh, sure. Yeah. We by were, all means. Yeah. We tell us about screen about. captures. Fascinating so, subject. <laughs> oh my gosh. So the. Um, the argument that some of the opponents to these exemptions keep making and have been making since 2009 when they said that we should all set up camcorders in our living room and make our living rooms perfectly dark and um, and use our phones or camcorders to, to shoot the screen, which, I mean, let's run down the number of things that that requires, right? A living room you can make perfectly dark, a camcorder that can do that kind of work, a really big screen TV. I mean, it was ridiculous. But they've been making this claim again and again, and it keeps coming up. And it's just absurd, right? I mean, nobody is saying you can't screen capture. If you want it, if it works for you, sure. But 
for what we have been trying over and over to point out is that there are plenty of uses for which it won't work. There are circumstances under which it won't work. And so saying that that always has to be the first thing that you try is silly. Um, it's impractical and it just doesn't make any sense aesthetically or from my point of view, legally. I mean, the point is to get video onto your computer so you can take tiny snippets of it and, and make a video, right? A lot of tiny clips. I mean, back to the licensing thing for a second. Um, if I use a hundred clips in a three minute vid and I make five vids a year, that's an awful lot of clips that I would have to license. Um, so the, the distinction between screen capture and ripping is not intuitive. Right? The result is the same. You get the video from some other form into a form that you can try to edit it. So why is this, why the complication? Like why not just say, if the use is fair, if you're using a small portion for criticism or commentary, if you're making an argument about the source, you're adding something to it, and it's not interfering with the market, done. Right? <laughs> it's, it's hard to understand why it needs to be more complex Well, than and that. the thing about that comment that I found surprising was that fair use over time, statements of best practices and scholars, communities of practice, you know, whether it's choreographers, poets, documentary filmmakers, and others have basically been able to say, let's take the case law, distill it, talk about what's appropriate, and then come up with best practices that can be used by anyone. You don't have to have a law degree to do it, and you can do it safely. Right? And then you have people like Michael Donaldson, Pam Samuelson, and others who have said, let's look at the case law altogether, and actually it's pretty simple, and you can do it in, in a simple three-step test. Right? And <clears throat> Peter Yaz is another example who's come up with a very simple two-part test that really gets to the heart of fair use. So it's not necessary, and it's certainly not a given that you have to have such simple, that you have to have such complex language that only lawyers can access. And I have to confess that after the 2009 exemption, excuse me, the 2000, uh, there's so many. 15, um, 15. 12. At one, at one point, at one point there, there, was, there was an exemption that even I had difficulty, who's, who's done this for you know, many years at this point, had difficulty understanding. Uh, now, you mentioned uh, clearing 100 clips for five videos a year. And the studio's argument was, we'll just, if you, if you need clips, just ask us for licenses. Do you think they would welcome thousands of filmmakers, sending them thousands of, hundreds of, millions of requests for licenses? I think licenses? they don't understand how many people make remix video, right? Or how, or how many clips are in a video, or um, how, how much simpler it is for us to just say, I have. You know, I have possibly the DVD, the Blu-ray, and some other format. Let, let me just let me just make the clips, which I can, because it's fair use. We did hear today that there's a phone number with a named person. Maybe we could distribute the phone numbers to all of your constituencies, <laughs> and they could call them whenever they need that a license. That could be fun. Well, like, could we turn that into performance art in some way? Well, it would certainly be an interesting thing to enter into the evidentiary record in 2021. I will say, though, it's possible that they do know how many people are making remix video, and they do know how many people are are, are engaged in this kind of creativity because, at least for for some portion of it, they're getting, for example, uh, content ID revenues. Um, it's possible that they know how many people are doing this. They don't want those people to call. What they want to be able to do is selectively enforce against the ones they don't like and allow the ones they do like to uh, to flow free and possibly even benefit them uh, uh, directly commercially and probably definitely indirectly commercially as people are exposed uh, to, to their works. So I think uh, with the desire for selective enforcement uh, while I think I don't think you're going to hear that out loud, and it's not nefarious, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's a it's a natural desire, and I think that's probably what we're seeing. I remember when the um, compulsory license for internet streaming radio was being raised to the point where it's no longer viable. Someone from the Recording Industry Association at a hearing saying very frankly, uh, "We don't like the idea that there's 10,000 people making uses, and we have to we don't know who to call if we don't like them." Once we raise the statutory royalty to the point where there's only five companies that can do it, we'll know who to call when we have a problem. Well, even when they provide 
sources that you're supposed to be able to use as an educator or as a creator, when they throw those in the record, they, they mention their own site, Fandango's movie clips, they mention Fandango's YouTube page. You have all sorts of contractual region, reasons why none of those are viable options for our hmm. folks. They say things like, well, you can't use it for personal use. You can't use it for anything but non-commercial use. And those were the sources they said, you know, if you didn't go and get an explicit license from them and have 100,000 people call them, that you supposedly were supposed to be able to use those sources, but those aren't even viable. I wanted to ask one last question before lunch. Uh, and this is a kind of a, uh, both a technical and a kind of real politic question. One of the things that kept coming up is whether, when, and how, and how hard it is to break DRM. There's this sense from the DRM proponents that it should be a solemn occasion when you break DRM, like, like breaking open the nuclear football. But the reality, I think, that I, the sense that I got from you guys, from my own experience, and certainly from my DRM standardization work, where people from the studios are pretty frank about the fact that they break DRM all the time, uh, is that it's just not hard. Do you think that they understand in their heart of hearts that DRM is just like the minimum viable law, uh, technology to invoke the law, and that as a technical matter, it's a kind of a nonsense? I'm not sure I agree with that. No? I mean, I think they spend a lot of time trying to make these these work, and some of the later ones are more difficult. Um, but I think the greater point is, this is not about piracy it's, or counterfeiting uh, or that kind of that kind of thing. It's simply not because there's never been any allegation, of any any connection between mm -hmm. that kind of copyright infringement and what's at issue here. These are people trying to do the right thing that are prevented from doing it. And unfortunately it is true that if you're worried about uh, break, whether a few people more would be breaking encryption on Blu-ray, for example, unfortunately that ship has sailed when it comes to, I think, what, they're, what they ought to be most concerned about, which would be um, that kind of thing. Well, and what's interesting in most of these cases, the folks that we work with have obtained lawful access to the work to begin with. They often have purchased a DVD or Blu-ray. So as far as, a, you know, how they're affecting markets to begin with, they're, you know, that's sort of a prerequisite to be using this is that you access the work lawfully. And if you look at Congress's intent, Congress has said, it's actually, if it's a, if it's a copy control, you can, you can break that. It's an access control that you're not allowed right. to break. Access controls would be like, a password. A copy control would be like the idea to make a backup copy. The law says you can, you can rip that. Um, but what we have with encryption and, DR and, and DVD encryption, Blu-ray encryption is access and use merged together. But Congress basically said, if you, if you, uh, if you buy it and you can access that work by buying a lawful DVD player and a lawful DVD, then you know if you want to make a copy, go ahead, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact is, the technical way that that, that these DRM technologies actually work conflates the two and so you have one use over here that's supposed to be permitted by Congress and one use that's supposed to be not permitted but essentially the way that the technology works is that they're both prevented and uh, it's very unfortunate. And I do think that uh, when, when you describe uh, circumventing DRM as easy I think it's true that for every new DRM, there's going to be a new 16-year-old in Norway who figures out how to get around it. Um, but I also think that uh, it's harder to make good art than it is to circumvent DRM. Right? So using Handbrake takes practice. Uh, using screen capture technology takes practice. Um, but we, what we shouldn't be thinking about is uh, making, the, is, is placing technological barriers between here and good art, right? That's mm -hmm. not what the Copyright Act is supposed to do. Um, and so to me, right, whether or not it's easy or commonplace to break DRM isn't the question. The question is, what's the law doing standing between here and legal art. And, and as advocates, it seems like that is a wave that we really have to deal with, which is a challenge because just in preparation for this hearing, even just the few first months of 2018, there was a lot, there's a lot that's been written about the accessibility and ability to screen capture, take video of things that are on, that are coming through your device. And there's, you know, cer certainly there are folks who are capable, right, of, of breaking those, but there's a lot of folks who, who would just give up. Right, mm -hmm. and so a lot of everyday uses. So they're like, mm -hmm. look what I saw, this crazy, th you know, and everyday uses that might clearly be fair use, where 
and, and it's interesting because a lot of these distributors, let's say a Netflix or an Amazon, there's there's a number of pieces of content now that are solely licensed through those avenues. So both by the technical res technical restrictions as well as the contractual restrictions, in a lot of ways, what the joint creators, you know, the, the film studios were saying on the record about there being so much more accessibility, that's not really true. Mm. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you for your great advocacy for fair use and for, for a fair deal for the public and copyright. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you.